Looking back now, would you say it was a good idea? It seemed like a good idea. <laughs> Welcome to Sudan. Vietnam, Egypt. Starting in his home country, Denmark, Thor Peterson set out on a mission to visit every country in the world without using an airplane. If you're trying to go to every country in the world, it's challenging. What Thor is doing, it's insane. I'm doing it because it has not been done before. I can't believe how difficult this is. It was never meant to be like this. He thought it would take just below four years. Today marks eight years, eight months, and eight days. It's like, you just started up a relationship. How are you going to do this? I cannot stop him in doing what he wants to do. But why is he going to leave all that behind? I feel like I'm at a breaking point. The airport looks really tempting. Son, if I should die, don't fly home to look at the dead body. I've done 90% of it. How do you not? cross that finish line when it's right there. That is getting close. Is everything so much harder than what it has to be? Either you've done it or you've not done it at all. So my decision is complete or quit. And I'm not quitting. I have strength within myself to fight for this. I'm going to fight until I drop. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Tim Sweeney. I'm leading global communications for Solomon. Welcome to all the people here in our flagship store in Annecy, right next to our headquarters, and all the people watching online, thanks for joining us. This, as you know, is Thor Peterson. How are you? I'm doing good. What do you Thank think of that? Me. That looks crazy. It looks yeah. like you. It's uh, that, that was me. Was you. I'm much okay. more comfortable now. So first time back in France in how long? Uh, oh, that's a good question. That could be six years, maybe? Six years. And yeah. a lot of other stops along the way. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to get into it. Um, let's start first. This is 10 years. Do you want to sit or you want to stand? Yeah, let's you. sit. So this marks 10 years ago this month you set off. Is that right? Almost. Yeah, so it's 10 years. What's today? The 13th today? 12th? 12th, 12th today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's 10 years and two days since I left home. home. And I've been back home for 78 days today. So, so we'll it's still pretty fresh. We'll get into the uh, adjustment of being back home later on, but let's talk about, for people who don't know the full story, what's the motivating factor to travel to every country in the world? You've got this down pat. Every country in the world on an unbroken journey, continuously, not using an airplane, but that's not your spiel. What exactly is the... Oh, that was pretty good. <laughs> you can use it if you want. Uh, yeah, I like to phrase it, every single country in the world in one unbroken journey completely without flying. I mm. just think that's a little bit more it's simple. Smoother, <laughs> smoother than what I said. So <laughs> let's talk about, you thought it would take, first of all, why, why? Why do it? Yeah. Still trying to figure that out? Yeah, so, <laughs> so why not? Why, why not do yeah. it? Oh, uh, he stole that from George Solomon. Why mm. not? Yeah. Is that right? Did yeah. I do that? Yeah. Uh, well, why? I, I think it's good to push the envelope forward and this was something that had never been done before and I think that's really where we progress as humans that's when we push limits and we discover not only more about who we are as people but we just discover in general and I've always been intrigued by adventurers when I was 
this high, I would run around in the forest and pretend that I was Indiana Jones or I was Robin Hood. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and when I got a little bit older, I would read about the first, the first to go to the North Pole, the first to go to the South Pole, the highest mountains, the deepest seas, the darkest forests. And then I slowly realized it's over. All of this has been done. A lot of this has been done 50 years or 100 years ago, and there's nothing left. And then when I found out that no one had gone to every country without flying, I was hooked. You said, that'll be easy, I'll do it in <laughs> how long? <laughs> what was the estimation when you, when you left? Well, you can... Because you have some, we, should, we should say you, have some, you had some rules to the journey. So yeah. you're not just popping around from beach to beach. And no, so if, you, if you're going hour. to do something like that, and if you want to go out and claim history, which was something I was hoping to do. I was there for the adventure as well. I was there to explore and meet people and taste food, but, but there was this historical sense about it. Then you want to be really sure about what you're doing. So you set down rules. And I thought that a really clean definition of going to every country in the world without flying would be one, no flying whatsoever. Uh, so any form of flight would void the project. And then I figured, how long do you need to be in a country before you can count it as a visit? And this is a huge debate amongst travelers. And uh, 24 hours seems to be enough to convince people that you were there, at least. But of course, you can step over the border if you want, and then you have technically been there. But 24 hours gives you a night, you meet people, you get something to eat, and at least you know something. And then the no return home um, project, or uh, rule, the no return home rule as well. Because I didn't want to have a debate afterwards, was it one journey or two journeys or 10 journeys and so on. So we put that together, no flying, minimum 24 hours, and no return home until the end or if I quit the project. So then how many countries are there in the world? Well, that's a debate as well. Uh, United Nations will give you 193, uh, 195 if you count the observer states as well. And the Olympics is typically 206. And then you have FIFA, and you have uh, ISO codes, and you have all sorts of, of numbers you can go with. So if you roughly estimate that there are about 200 countries, then you have to settle on how much time are you going to be spending in each country. And uh, let's say seven days. Let's say seven days per country. So seven times 200, that's very close to four years. But seven days isn't a lot in big countries like the US, or Russia, or Algeria, or China. And there are many big countries. So what about a month in every country in the world? And then you do a month times 200, and then it's 16 years of your life. So the difference between a week and a month in every country in the world is the difference between four years and 16 years. And I didn't feel like I had 16 years. Yeah, I think your girlfriend would have probably agreed with that <laughs> sentiment at the time, yeah? Yeah, there, there wouldn't have been a girlfriend to come home to. But yeah, so I figured four years, and I, then I had been to a lot of countries. I'd been to France before, I'd been to Sweden before, and Norway and Germany, and many countries before. So I figured if I would run a little bit quick through those countries, I could be back home after three and a half years. Easy. Easy. No worries. Yeah. But it wasn't quite like that. No, no, it and wasn't. It, it took instead not, almost 10. Yeah, nine years, nine months, and 16 days. And the last few were challenging. Absolutely. The yeah. difference between 190 or whatever you said in 207 was <laughs> how many years? That uh, would have been, so between 193 and 203, 203. Would, would have been three and a half years. Three extra years. Yeah. So yeah, we had a nice pandemic thrown in there. Yeah, that was good. Which if people don't know, you <laughs> spent how long in Hong Kong? Yeah, I was on board a container ship which was going to take me to Hong Kong for transit. So I wasn't supposed to visit Hong Kong for anything else than, than transit. I'd been to China and I counted Hong Kong as a part of China. So transit and then a second ship would take me to Palau. And I was down to the nine last countries within a project that was already seven years uh, in. So way overdue. Mm -hmm. And I was offline for 12 days and uh, we reached Hong Kong. And I come up on the bridge and the captain is there and the captain is wearing a face mask. And he hands me one and says, you better put this on. And I say, what's going on? And he says, there's been an outbreak in Wuhan. And I say, what's a Wuhan? <laughs> and he says, well, that's a city in China. And uh, I got an internet signal and I could see it was a thousand kilometers away. And I laughed 
And we're like, that's so far away. That's not going to have anything Joke to do with me. Joke was on you, I guess. Yeah. 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 I was supposed Jeez. to be four days in Hong Kong and I ended up being in Hong Kong for two years. So, so that slowed the journey down to yeah, an understatement. Quite a lot. And then the remaining Jeez. nine countries were all island nations. And a lot of small island nations took it very, very seriously. Um, especially within the Pacific, they were worried about their immune defense and uh, that they wouldn't be able to handle the virus in the same way that uh, big societies would. So they really shut their borders down. Yeah. And the ships, they didn't want to get quarantined because if they got quarantined anywhere, container ships, and then they would have to pay a lot of money. This could cost them millions. So they didn't want to risk taking an, a passenger on board. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't get inside the countries, they couldn't get on board the ships, and that continued for a full year beyond leaving Hong Kong. So we mentioned the ships, and I guess just to go back a step, which is how you got around from place to place. You're not using planes, you're on foot. What happens when you, you have to get a visa? People don't always account for that, like the yeah. bureaucracy. That was the, some of the stuff we saw you yeah. banging your head against the wall. <laughs> so can you explain kind of what's the process if, I, if you want to go from one country to another and not go home? Because that yeah. adds a certain element to the whole thing. Well, the exciting stuff is generally when it goes wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Especially, th those are the good stories. And I'd have to say, if, if you, you come from Denmark, as I do, then you have the luxury of having a Danish passport, and that opens up a lot of the world for you. So maybe 80% of the world was fairly straightforward. A lot of countries, no visa requirements whatsoever, and a lot of countries, visa on arrival. So it's within the last 20%. So to give you an idea, when I reached, there are two Congos in Africa right next to each other. There is uh, Congo Brazzaville and there's Congo Kinshasa. And I was in Congo Brazzaville and I went to the embassy of Congo Kinshasa applying for the visa. And they say, we cannot give you the visa because you're not a resident here. So you should go back to Denmark 5,000 kilometers away and apply for this visa. And I try to explain and they don't care. So then what I do is I apply for paperwork and I get residency in Congo. So that took me about a month and then finally I have my residency card and I come back to the embassy and say, okay, I'm a resident. Looking back now, would you say it was a Such a good story, you want to hear it again? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so then the lady behind the counter tells me that, okay, now we can start processing. I need a certain document. The only way I can get this document is by going to this address, she gives me an address, says go over there, sign all the paperwork, pay 50 US dollars and bring the document back. And I take a look at the address, and the address is across the border in Congo, Kinshasa, where I'm trying to go. So I say, how am I supposed to go and get this document if I don't have the visa? Just, this is not my problem. So then you find someone who can go on your behalf and you get this done and eventually this, you get but it this back. Is right? all to go for 24 hours. Yeah, this check it <laughs> off the list. So a month, yeah. waiting a month to go in yeah. for 24 hours to move on to the next place. In this uh, same town, Brazzaville, I was applying for the visa for Angola. And um, so it's a French speaking country. And uh, je parle très petit français. By the way. And, and I walk inside the embassy and I look at this woman and I say, Bonjour, ça va? And uh, she looks at me and in perfect French, she, sa she says, Go away and don't come back until you know how to speak French or if you bring someone who speaks French. I say, Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Bonsoir. And then I go and I get Maria and I bring Maria and she's, she's very charming and she speaks French. And, and then uh, we get a piece of paper that we're supposed to fill in. This is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. It costs 10 US dollars for this. So we fill it in and then I bring it and then she says, oh, you filled in with a blue pen, you're supposed to use a black pen. So you pay $10, you get a new document and you do this again. There was a guy with a motorcycle who was trying to go through this area and um, they looked at his shoes and they said, uh, we don't like uh, motorcycle shoes. So go and get different shoes and try to come and apply for the visa again. In my case, they didn't like my passport photo. So I was wearing a t-shirt in my passport photo. I was supposed to have a, what do you call it? Collared shirt. A, a yeah. collar, a cravat. Yeah. 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 So okay, then you go out and get new passport photos and you come back again. There's this kind of nonsense a lot. 200 times. No, yeah. less, because some of them were easier. <laughs> um, I want to switch gears just so we can explain to people here in the room and watching the connection to Solomon. You know what that is? I do know what that is. That is an invoice. A little receipt. That's a receipt. For what? 
Yeah, so I um, had to prepare for the project and uh, I left home on the 10th of October 2013 at 10, 10 a.m. So there was a lot of preparation up to that date and I needed some solid footwear. So I went into a sports shop in Copenhagen where I live and I asked for some footwear that would be good for wet and dry and hot and cold. And uh, they pulled down a pair of Salomon shoes for me and said, these are versatile, these would be good. How long do you think you'll be gone? I said, maybe three and a half years if I go a little fast. Said, yeah, okay, try these. And they fit and I paid for them. And then I left in Salomon footwear. And then after a couple of years, I guess, I wore them out and I got a new pair of Salomon. And then after a couple of years, I wore them out and I got a couple of new Salomon. And all while I was tweeting Salomon in France, saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm traveling around the world, only in your footwear, every country, your footwear, so far, 50 countries, 60 countries, 70 countries. And Salomon was ignoring me and ignoring me and ignoring me. Cut this me. part out. We're cutting this <laughs> out. <laughs> no, but, but then I one day I got uh, a tweet back from Salomon. Yep. He said, is this real? I said, yeah, 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 yeah. He said, oh, we should get on a call. And we did. We did. I think I was on that first call. Yeah. Maybe Adrian as well, who's yeah. back there. He's played a key role in and Bruno. bringing you into the fold. Yeah. So Thor is a Salomon ambassador now. Yeah. Um, and the first call was hilarious because he, I think you were five plus years in. Yeah, I was at about 170 countries. Yeah, and then at some point he referenced that, yeah, my girlfriend in, in back home, and I was like, wait, 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 wait a minute. You, you've, you've kept a girlfriend for five years while you traveled around the world. Who is this woman? So now it's yeah. his wife. But she kept me. <laughs> oh, yeah, I suppose that's true. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so we so, got engaged on top of Mount Kenya, and uh, then we thought we'd get married maybe in New Zealand not long after that. So we started planning for that. Then the pandemic happened. And then she was in Denmark and I was in Hong Kong. And the only way she could come inside Hong Kong was if she was my wife. She was my fiance. So this wasn't good enough. And then we found out that there's an agency in Utah where you can get married online. <laughs> <laughs> so we tried this and uh, she got married on December 19 and I got married on December 20 because of the time difference. Ah. But the paperwork was okay for Hong Kong and then she was able to come to Hong Kong quarantine for three weeks, and then we were together for about 100 days. Wow, persistence. And then that was not recognized by the Danish government. So when she later on came and visited me in Vanuatu, we got married one more time, this time on the beach. And unfortunately, the government of Vanuatu had a hacker attack, a ransomware attack, My and God. then two typhoons. So that's almost one year ago now, and we're still not married officially. Okay. But we do know we're married in Utah, Hong Kong, and Vanuatu. All right. Yes. And she's come out to visit you along the journey. Yeah, how she's many times? been out 27 times oh, so wow. far. She's okay. visited me in Sudan and Armenia and Jamaica, all sorts of exciting okay. destinations. She's seen a fair bit of the world with you. Yeah, she has. Um, let's talk about the route, I guess, because maybe people are curious how you, you started. So you yeah. kind of flew through Europe because that's pretty, well, clearly all connected and you can yeah. go pretty freely. Right. And what's the journey from there? And how are you doing it? Is it some bus, once you're on land, obviously it's buses and foot and yeah. hitchhiking, taxis. What are you doing? Biking? Well, so I noticed you said I flew through Europe. Well, comparatively. <laughs> no, not flew, sorry. <laughs> Quickly moved through Europe on the I ground. Know, I know what you mean. So I, I used to say time flies, I don't. Though I, I aim to go with uh, public transportation. So that's buses, trains, ferries, anything I can buy a ticket for. And uh, I think most of my transportation has probably been that. Hundreds and hundreds of buses and trains, and many, many ferries, basically anything that floats at this point, tugboats, high performance yachts, container ships and whatnot. So the route was to start off in Denmark. And then I went to Germany and I did Central and Western Europe. So imagine a world map, then you'll have Europe and Africa, and you have North America, Central America, South America over there. And then over here you have Asia, and then you have the South Pacific and the North Pacific and Australia, New Zealand down here, right? I thought you were going to give a weather report there. Yes, That's yes. So it's going to be sunny tomorrow. <laughs> 
So I started in Europe, then I made it over the North Atlantic with seven different ships and came to North America, then I went Central America, then I went South America, then I went up again through the Caribbean, then from the Caribbean I came over the Atlantic Ocean back to Europe. From Europe I could get into Africa. So that was Western Africa, then it was Central Africa, then it was Southern Africa, then it was Eastern Africa, then into the Indian Ocean where I could visit some of the island nations there, back into Eastern Africa, up to Northern Africa, from Northern Africa back into Europe, did the rest of Europe, now Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe brought me into the Middle East. From the Middle East, I was already inside Asia, so that brought me into Central Asia. Central Asia could take me into Eastern Asia. Then Southeastern Asia. Southeastern Asia brought me into the South Pacific. Then into North Pacific. Then there was a global pandemic that had me in Hong Kong for two years. Then finally, I was able to go to the remaining Pacific islands, including New Zealand and Australia. And then from New Zealand and Australia, I could start to make my way back to the Indian Ocean, where I clocked. Sri Lanka and the Maldives, and then I got on some ships to come back home. Three ships took me back home to Denmark, where I came home on the 26th of July, 2023. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank I feel you. like you've done that before. That's you've rehearsed yes, that a well. Few times. So just to put it in context, that was conservatively a distance of 382,000 kilometers. So what's 382,000 kilometers? That is akin to going nine and a half times around the planet or one time to the moon. Also to put things in context, you have more than 6,000 people who have been on top of Mount Everest. You, have, you actually have more than 17,000 people who have completed Tour de France. Yeah, that's a big number, I think. You have more than 550 people who have been to space but you have less than 300 people who have been to every country in the world. Even and using planes, that includes... They, are, yeah. they all use planes. In total. So then you have four wow. people who have been to every country in the world two times. And you have two people who have been to every country in the world in one go, meaning that they left home and they didn't come back until they'd been to every country. And I'm one of those two. And now you have one person who has been to every country completely without flying. So it is a little bit unique. Just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you put it like that. Yeah, well, um, let's talk about the big, big journeys because we saw some container ships there and that's kind of what bridges the big moves for you. Right. There's some sketchy moments there yeah. traveling by vessel that some you said some, several of them are at the bottom of the ocean now that you yeah. know of. Um, yeah, so there are, there are ships yeah. that are in good condition and there are ships that are in less good condition. Sometimes it's big shipping yeah. container ships, right? Other also. times it's a ferry in the middle of nowhere that yeah. is not advisable maybe for <laughs> most people to use. I've been with small open boats where there's nowhere to hide from the sun or from the weather and you cross between countries and, and it does the job. I've been on board uh, luxury yachts. I've been on board 40 container ships. I've been on board uh, one of the largest container ships in the world. It's uh, 400 meters long. So it's like four football fields. It takes about 20,000 containers on board. There's a pool on board. There's buffet every day. Everyone has a nice cabin on board. It's really comfortable. It's sounds huge easy. vessel. This yeah. all sounds so easy, what, you, what you've done when you but mentioned it. Then I've been one. on three ships that sank okay. after I was on board. <laughs> right. yeah. um, we call those uh, soul sellers. So a soul seller is a vessel that's in so poor condition that it is going to sink, for sure. Everybody knows it will sink, but nobody knows when will it sink. So it's sort of like playing Russian roulette with ships. And you call it a soul seller because if you get on board, then your soul is for sale. And sometimes that's the only option you have if you're not willing to fly. So I've been on several of those and it always went well in my case. But then I heard from other people that three of them are now at the bottom of the sea. And unfortunately, two of those vessels took a lot of lives with them as well. So you had, on that note, you had a, a lot of, or a few anyway, quite scary moments beyond just the frustrating moments or trying to navigate the logistics, yeah. etc. cetera. Um, I've been lucky to see some of the early work of the film that's coming next year. Um, and there's some wild stuff on there. I mean, you were in the North Atlantic going from Iceland to Canada. Yeah, that's right. And on a container ship yeah. with some massive sea with ice too, right? Like yeah, crazy. exactly. So there, that was, uh, I was on board this container ship. It was about 140 meters long. 
and the captain was from Ukraine. His name was uh, Andre. And I'm up on the bridge together with Andre, and the sun is setting, and it's beautiful, and the ocean is calm. And he looks at me, and he says, it's never like this. He's never seen it this calm before. And I think that's a good thing. And then he says, it's going to be eight days across, and then we will reach Canada. And we set out, and after a couple of days, the ship starts rolling from one side to the other. It starts pitching up and down. The waves, they start coming up harder and harder. They start banging in over the containers. It's impossible to stand on your feet at this point. So you have to hold on to something. If you do not hold on, then you will fall on the floor and you will slide from one side to the other. Now, you can hear the ocean. The ocean sounds angry. It's black outside. There's thunder. There's lightning. It's raining. We weren't far from where Titanic went down. This ship was not ice class, and we start getting reports up on the bridge that there's ice sightings nearby where we are. So and this went on for how long? This went on for four days. Yeah. That sounds pleasant. So that's yeah. four days where when you get something to eat, you sit down and you hold on to the table. Because if you don't hold on to the table, then your chair will fall on the side with you. And you also hold on to your plate. Because if you don't hold on to your plate, then your plate will fly into the wall. And then you quickly realize you're out of hands. So you try to eat in between the rolls and you quickly get something. It's, uh, you lie down in your bed and you wake up on the floor. You lie down in your bed, you wake up on the floor. You try to have a shower and you turn on the water and the water comes this way. <laughs> and then the water goes this way. And you can imagine going to the toilet was a big adventure as well. So. All right, we'll switch gears on that now. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the, because we have some, a lot of outdoor athletes here and I'm sure people yeah. watching the connection with Psalm and you were a runner in the past because I guess we should first touch on your work life prior to this. You've, right. Let's start with that. You've kind of acquired a lot of skills that you felt would come in handy and did indeed on the way. So what's the back life? What's the, the previous Thor before he became Indiana Jones, as you say, <laughs> um, before the journey started? What, were the, what was the work you did? Um... Well, I, first of all, I was, I was born in Denmark, but then pretty much before I could roll over on one side, we moved to Canada, where we lived for four years, and then the U.S. for two and a half years. And then we came back to Denmark. So I think I started to develop some people skills from an early age, moving around, meeting new people, making new friends. Then I went to school in Denmark, and I did business school, and I followed up. I was drafted to the military, did military service, and built on top of that with international duty as a United Nations peacekeeper and I was uh, sent on a mission in, on the, the African Horn as well. Came back and started a career within shipping and logistics. I was a ski instructor for a while in between there. Then shipping and logistics and that gave me a career which was international. So I worked uh, two years in Libya, I worked one year in Bangladesh, I worked in Kazakhstan, in Azerbaijan, in the Arctic Circle, in Greenland, a lot of places around the world. So I had been exposed to the world and different cultures. I think that was really helpful. The military career was really helpful. The moving around when I was a child, that was really, really helpful. I even worked at a homeless shelter while I was um, planning this project and getting the project ready. And that was also really helpful because I ended up spending a lot of time in different slum areas. Yeah, it's, I mean, you lived a more adventurous life than most people before you traveled every country in the world <laughs> consecutively. I don't know. Um, let's talk about the challenges like mentally and there's you used social media along the way and I guess improved at it and it's not your favorite thing to do but a necessity I suppose um, and that stuff can be stressful I guess like kind of keeping with it you sought kind of I guess uh, relief in in nature along the way too can you talk a little bit about that balance between like all the navigating all the bureaucratic work you had to do filing yeah. for visas, et cetera, and then like the release to get away from it all, because I think people here and in our audience can identify with that a bit. Yeah, so uh, I, think the, I think where I want to start is from the very beginning when I leave home, because I left home feeling that this was a huge adventure, and if two weeks of holiday is good, then two years is even better, right? And when I left home, it felt like it was 99% adventure, exploring, meeting people, tasting food, seeing new places, being on the move, enjoying, and 1% work. Visas, getting tickets, finding a SIM card, uploading a blog, and stuff like this. 
And then gradually over the first two years, I found this transition where it turned into 99% work and 1% adventure and enjoyment. And I really haven't met a lot of people who travel for more than two years. So it gets hard. You're living out of a bag and uh, you feel a little bit rootless and uh, you've seen enough and you've explored enough and you want to go home and recharge and then maybe go out and travel again at some point if you have the opportunity. But I was at 100 countries, barely at 100 countries after two years. So I wasn't really halfway yet. So I had to push on beyond that. And it started to become this incredible mental battle to stick with what I set out to do. And my release many times when I'm frustrated is to go running, to put on some trainers and get out there. Maybe run in a neighborhood or run in the wild if that's possible. But I do feel like when it's a mess inside my head and when the stress and the tension builds up, then I can go for a run and I come back as a completely different person. So that's been really, really helpful for me. And I knew that from, say, my previous life before that crazy project that I would go running frequently. I would uh, sign up for local races. I had, I've done a few marathons within my lifetime. And then when the pandemic broke out and I got stuck in Hong Kong, I got into long distance running, trail running. Yeah, so you documented a lot of this, and you had all your gear, which was yeah. nice. Your my Salomon <laughs> gear. Yeah, your vest, etc. I know Adrian and those guys sent you some stuff. Yeah. Um, what kind of running projects did you do while you were there? You were ticking them off today at lunch, and it was impressive. <laughs> well, it's, it's crazy. That's what it is. So Hong Kong is amazing. I don't know. Have, have any of you ever been to Hong Kong? Yes, a few of you, a handful. I love Hong Kong. I see Hong Kong as my second home. The biggest surprise for me about Hong Kong was that it was 75% nature and only 25% urban setting. They have mountains that stretch almost up to 1,000 meters, waterfalls and monkeys and wild boar and snakes and so on. So as soon as the pandemic broke out and I started to get really frustrated, I would take into nature. And uh, the first project was to go up on the highest mountain in Hong Kong and sort of challenge myself with that. And that was done within a day. So up on the mountain and then back down, and then I felt like I, had, I was accomplished. So the next challenge was to look at, they, had, they have this trail which is 100 kilometers across Hong Kong with an elevation gain of more than 5,000 meters in between. So I wanted to see if I could do that in three days. And I managed to do that hiking in three days, and I was quite proud with that. Then I learned that that was nothing. So they had a 50K trail, they have a 70K trail, and a 78k trail. So I wanted to see if I could do those. And then I wanted to see if I could do them in one day. And then eventually I wanted to see if I could do the 100 kilometer trail in less than 20 hours. And I managed to do that. I managed to do a 50k trail in less than six hours with an elevation gale and gain of 1700 meters in between. Uh, we did a step challenge, me and some friends I made in Hong Kong where we had a week to do as many steps as possible. And the winner, I think that was me, the first step challenge was about 350,000 steps. So we were quite impressed with that and we drank a lot of beer and we were laughing. And then we decided to do a second step challenge. And then the winner did more than 400,000 steps during the second one. And then we decided to do the last step challenge. And I figured if I could do half a million steps, then for sure I would win. But half a million steps is doing 11, 12 hours of walking every day. It's about 50, 54 kilometers per day, seven days in a row. And I clocked 400, uh, five, 504,000 steps, so over half a million steps in a week. My feet were completely destroyed. Stop, I lost stop, several stop, stop, toes. Stop, stop. And <laughs> when, and I came in third. <laughs> I didn't even win on that one. Yeah, no, we did some crazy stuff. But it was sort of to remove focus from the real problem, which was there was no control when the pandemic broke out. So a question then, where does that come from in you? Because like I, Mike Douglas, who a lot of people at Solomon knows, worked on Solomon TV for a long time, is the guy working on the film project. He's been out to see you a bunch of times. And That photo there is uh, Mike, Mike Douglas' work. So he 
he told me, and he said it before, that you're one of the most persistent and stubborn people. And like, where did these little, pro just to do that project, of course, takes some serious commitment. And that you could have just gone to the airport at any time to sort of throw in the towel and I miss my family, I want to get home, etc. But even these little projects you're making just to like check things off, where, where do you think that comes from in you to kind of like think up something that is insane, like walking for 12 hours a day just around the city? I don't know. I think I've, I, I've been trying to trace it back and it goes back pretty far in my life that I get some idea and then I set out to see if I can accomplish it. We have this one island in Denmark, it's 300 kilometers around it, and I'd learned a little bit about kayaking, and I decided, well, I'm going to do a trip around this island. And it took me eight days, and I was sick and tired of it after a couple of days, and my hands were full of blisters, and the wind was in my face, but I kept paddling just so I would get to the end of it, and then threw the paddle away and put my hands in the air. Um, I kept reaching out to Salomon, even though I didn't hear anything for years and years and years and years, because it's in my head that this is what I want to do. <coughs> I, did, uh, sorry, I did the same with uh, Maersk, which is a Danish shipping company. So uh, to keep myself entertained, when I left Denmark, I saw a, a Maersk container, and I figured, well, okay, they're everywhere. And I saw one in Germany, and I saw one in the Netherlands, and I decided that's my own personal game. When I'm in a train or in a bus, I'll look for one of these containers in every country I go to. And then I reached about 30 countries where I've seen these containers, and then suddenly <coughs> I'm going to tweet them to Maersk, and I'm going to tell Maersk I've seen their containers in all these countries, and I'm going to all the countries, and they will love it, and this is going to be a great adventure together. Millions will follow. And Millions I, of dollars. I was <laughs> tweeting Maersk, and they didn't care at all. And I kept doing it, and I kept doing it, and when I reached almost 100 countries, finally Maersk came to me and said, is this true? Have you seen our containers in all these countries? And I said, nobody cares. Of course it's true. Why would I lie about that? <laughs> and then I started to have a collaboration with Maersk. And the story goes on and on and mm. on. It's uh, about persistence in many cases, even though when no one can see the logic in it. Yeah, but it might take a long therapy session to figure out the root <laughs> of that. We don't, we're not going to do it here. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the film project a bit, because yeah. this is a new thing for you, being filmed and... Um, just to kind of tease that it's coming next year. Mike's working on it now and working on finding production partners, etc. cetera. Um, he's been out to see you three times, four times? Four times, And yeah. he made the last journey with you? Uh, yes, he did. So yeah. he came to Marshall Islands, which is in the Pacific, and then he came to Fiji once, and then he came to Fiji twice, and then he came to Sri Lanka, which was my penultimate country, the second last country. And then he joined the ship from Sri Lanka to the Maldives, which was the final country. Right. Another front runner just wanted to be there at the end to celebrate. <laughs> right? um, so, so the the film will be a lot of like your introspective moments, which we saw a bit of. Also, GoPro you had, and I guess the technology changed considerably. Yeah. The social guys would tell us that in ten years, like <laughs> the cameras you could use then versus now, and you've had hours and hours and hours, hundreds of hours of clips and photos, et cetera. Yeah. Um, what's, what's it been like to be documenting your own journey? Wh when did that click, I guess, along the way? Is it, it's another set of skills in a way. Yeah, for sure. So I'm much more of a picture and words kind of guy. And when I set out from Denmark in 2013, that's what I wanted to do, not so much video. 2013, the newest iPhone was an iPhone 5, to put things in perspective. Just flip it open. Yeah. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> And uh, Instagram and Facebook were not focusing on video in 2013. It was still pictures. Mm -hmm. and, and so that came later on. TikTok didn't exist and, and YouTube existed, right? And I wasn't much of a video guy. So lots of photos, lots of words. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I did some video here and there. And then further down the line, I met Mike. Mm -hmm. And Mike looked at me and said, what are you doing? <laughs> Where's all the footage from Africa? Where's all the footage from South America? Where's all the footage from North America? And he gave me a couple of cameras and he said, okay, when you're happy, talk to the camera. <laughs> when you're angry, talk to the camera. And it's not really within me. It's not my first go-to thought that I'm really upset about something and then where's my camera? And then pick up the camera and scream at the camera. I think a lot of the good stuff goes lost because I'm not constantly with a selfie stick right. filming. So it's been a process, but we did capture 
some of my frustrations yeah. towards the end. Are you excited to see what comes? Are you frightened to see what, what you look like on film? And Because the, the, there's honest moments, right? That yeah, there are. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to see what comes. I, have f I fully trust Mike. Um, he's, he's a good friend today, and uh, I'm confident that he has my best interests. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious about it. It's not going to be a look at how beautiful the world is video. It's not going to be a travel, you should go to Bali, you should look at this beach. That's not what we're making. It's about the personal journey. It's about strength. It's about madness. It's about the beauty of the world, but not in the scenery, but in the kindness and the generosity of people around the world. So it's a personal journey from 2013 to 2013, so as far as I know. He might <laughs> surprise me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know how he's going to edit it. Um, well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I've seen a yeah, little, bit, little bit here and there that he's working on. Um, I want to. I know I'd, you don't want the inane questions like who has the best tasting beer or the I funniest can do that. people. Or, well, maybe <laughs> someone will ask that in a minute. I want to ask you about returning home because. Yeah. Um, Mike and I were speaking one time on the phone. I was like, maybe the story starts when he returns home. Is he going to lose his mind because he can't travel? What's the What's that <laughs> been like? I mean, what's the What's the uh, jokingly yeah. we're saying that? But what's but the Because you're not moving, you're not navigating in your mind. What's next? I mean, you're a busy guy now. I know, which is cool. It's kind of paying off with all the media and stuff like that. But yeah, what's the uh, adjustment like? Well, I think a lot of people, including myself, are expecting some sort of reaction after all of that, living out of a bag, constantly being on the move for almost a decade. So if you imagine that you want to incorporate something within your life, then in a popular sense, people say you should just do it 30 days in a row. So if you want to get up early in the morning, you set the clock for something earlier, and you do that 30 days in a row, and then it sort of becomes a part of your routine, and, and you can move on from that. What I did, I did that for more than 3,500 days. So it's so hardwired into my body. Um, applying for visas, finding my way to the next country, making visits with the Red Cross, updating social media, writing blogs, doing interviews, speaking engagements, all of this all around the world, over and over and over again. So there should be some sort of reaction. In the same way that when a soldier comes back from somewhere in the world, after six or seven months of deployment, in a stressful environment. You would expect that there would be some sort of reaction, that it would take some time to transition into life again. And Different some of those- Routines. Yeah, routines. Yeah. Some of them don't really come back <coughs> mentally. And I wonder what will, how much time will it take me to come back and sort of find uh, a normal life again? Mm -hmm. And is there going to be some sort of crash? Am I going to have stress? Am I going to go crazy? I, I really don't know. Um, so far, I'm not running around naked chasing cars in the street. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I've had these voices in my head in the, in the past weeks, uh, which not crazy voices, but, <laughs> but I had this voice which was telling me, don't give up. Just don't give up. Keep fighting for it. Don't give up. Don't give up. And I was wondering, what's that voice? Because it's, it's over already. The, the, so I think that's some sort of residue. I think that's something that's still stuck within me that when I didn't want to do it anymore, just keep fighting for it, keep fighting for it. And my wife tells me that half the time when she tells me something, I, I don't hear it and she has to repeat it again. <laughs> so there might be a little bit there. That might be normal though. <laughs> that might be normal. I don't ask people in the audience. Or <laughs> I can tell you this. I've, I've done a little more than a hundred interviews since I came back home, uh, which is, a lot for someone like me. Yeah. And I think the interviews are helpful. I think that the process of having people ask me questions and then me thinking about the questions and reflecting upon it and trying to give an answer is really helpful in finding out what was all of this about and what has it done to me and who am I today and what's my way forward. Well, maybe we should do some more. Let other people ask questions now. Yeah, sure instead of me. <laughs> but where is the best beer? The best beer is in the kingdom of Lesotho. It's called Maluti. There we go. Yeah. Um, how do you want to do this with the mics? Audience questions or straight? I think actually we have a couple from online. So maybe I should take those first. We posted it on Instagram. 
uh, he may have covered this, longest walk you've done in one day. Step challenge? <laughs> no. So the longest walk I did was the Maclehose Trail in Hong Kong. It's 100 kilometers. Plus, I also had to walk home after that. <laughs> so that was a long walk. Um, oh, broad one, but best experience you've had. I don't know. That's pretty general, but... Okay, so... Give me, what, give me a country that surprised you. Like, I wasn't <laughs> expecting this to be this cool, this fun. Um, I was surprised by Andorra. Okay. And it's a little bit stupid. It's born out of ignorance. For some reason, I thought Andorra was a poor country. I don't know why I thought that. But when I arrived, I saw that it was the absolute opposite. And it was full of mountains, and it was beautiful, and good logistics, and uh, wonderful culture, and nice people. And that surprised me. So that was just absolute ignorance about another country. Okay, I don't really understand this one, but what place has the softest ground? <laughs> what place has the softest ground? <laughs> Where your feet go? I, I would go with Bangladesh, because Bangladesh yeah. is just really moshy. It's at the foothills of the Himalayas, but they don't have mountains. So it's just swampland, all of it. And this one's a little more serious, I, I guess. Um, any regrets? Do you feel like you've been missing out on things while you're away? And I suppose that's easy to point to yeah. family Absolutely. moments. We saw the the comment from your dad, if I should die while you're gone, <laughs> serious stuff. <laughs> yeah. His dad's a character, apparently. The interviews are legendary. Yeah, very much so. Um, yeah, no, I, 10 years is a long time. And uh, I left when I was 34, and I came back when I was 44. And my parents were 65, and they were 75 when I came back. My wife was 30, and she's still 30, because that's how that oh, works. Smart. Yeah. He's, he's but <laughs> so, I mean, can you imagine all the children that have been born within my family, my cousins, and my, you know, and amongst my friends? I have a hard time from a distance trying to remember their names and how many children they have, all of that. I have friends that have had great moments within their life, and I was not there to celebrate with them. I also have friends and family who were hurt or attacked or were suffering in different ways, and I wasn't there to give them a hug. And I have this relationship with a wonderful woman, which uh, for the most part has been long distance. We've been together for 11 years now, and 10 of them have been long distance. So you can only wonder about what I might have missed out on. But yeah, I think when you look back on a project like this, there's no return on anything, right? So it's done, and you just have to look for the best within it. I think it was worthwhile. I think the film's going to be pretty good, based on that <laughs> answer. <laughs> a lot to cover. And there's a lot of that sort of stuff in, in there, I think. Yeah, Mike's really good Personal. at uh, interviewing yeah. and pulling that kind of stuff out of people. Um, thanks for the honesty. Uh, yeah. Do we have questions from the audience? He's got Adrian has a mic right there. Hi. Um, so, like, when I first heard about like your your trip and like you doing this ten years without flying, I mean, it, it kind of like leads to think that it was probably also based out of a sustainability or an environmental friendly like no um, motivation behind it. But throughout the interview, you haven't yet mentioned anything about it. Like, how much was it part of your journey? The whole, I mean, was it was not driven by a need to avoid planes. It was more from an adventure point of view. Did I get that right? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And it's a really good question. Um, it also speaks to how the world has changed between 2013 and 2023. Because when I talk to people now, no one can believe that it wasn't for environmental reasons. It's just uh, Greta Thunberg. She started campaigning and striking five years ago. So five years after I left home, that's where she started, right? So the world really changed with... Uh, those 10 years, and especially with her. and But it, there's maybe a surprising answer to that. So even though, because I could have jumped on that wave, right, with the environmental wave, but I didn't want to change my answer. I did it because this has not been done before, and I wanted the adventure within it. That was the reasoning behind setting out. I am immensely proud that my carbon footprint is minimal because of what I did. And the project, because I've been living like that for so long, has changed my mindset in regards to how I can travel. 
So I am on a little bit of a tour now. I, I was in Berlin uh, last night, and I had to be at the southern border of Denmark the day before that, because it was exactly 10 years after I left home, and then come here. And I tried to do that as much as possible without flying. Um, I had to fly between Berlin and Geneva because of time constraints. But I'm going home also, and even though it will take me two days to go home, essentially a day and a half by buses and train, I'm going to do it like that because I have the extra time and it'll I can work while I'm on the train and so on. So my thinking around how I behave and how I eat and how I use plastic and you know, just seeing the world and seeing the changes in the world, sometimes standing on piles of plastic uh, waiting for a bus to come and uh, seeing water levels coming up some places and storms intensifying and all of that has made me think. So in a different way, it has changed me and it has changed who I am today. But it wasn't from the onset, uh, the purpose of the project. Anyone else? <laughs> Everyone else is scared, so you, <laughs> you step up. So when you spoke about the itinerary, I mean, like you didn't mention the poles, so Arctic, Antarctic. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, do they count in the in the list of countries, or like, have you tried to go there? Or? I so there are two questions there. Do they count? No, there are no countries in Antarctica, and the North Pole. There is no land, so it melts uh, um, in the summertime more and more so these days. Um, but if you want to say you went to every continent, then you have to go to Antarctica. And I would like to be able to say that. Also, I want to go for the experience. I hear it's really, really beautiful and it's a very special environment. But then I also hear that it's environmentally damaging going to Antarctica. So then what are you going to do? Um, I did try to go. When I was in Tasmania, I tried to speak to different companies and uh, the Navy to see if they could bring me across. And it was the wrong time of the year. And then I tried again when I was in New Zealand, and they said, wrong time of the year, too much ice. So then I abandoned that for then. Just last question, I'll hand over. Yeah. Um, okay, okay. Like <laughs> how much did it cost you, and how did you finance it? Yeah, um, the short answer is that the budget was 20 US dollars per day, or 20 euro per day, for uh, almost 10 years. So that's, I think it's about 72,000 euros over the course. The 20 euros per day is for transportation, accommodation, meals, and visas. So those four elements. But then there were other costs than that, new passports, vaccines, and so on. <coughs> I'm sorry. But then um, you have to figure, too, that the value of $20 changes considerably over... Well, the last yeah, two years for sure, but <laughs> over 10 years, what you get for $20 <coughs> decreases considerably. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, you're right about that. Um, value has changed over the years, but I still stuck to the budget, and I kept within that. So where did the money come from? Well, the money came initially from Ross Engineering. Um, they became Ross Energy over time, so that's a company in Denmark that deals with drilling, particularly with geothermal energy, sustainable energy, there you go. And, and they asked me to promote that as I went along, as I'm doing right now. Then, unfortunately, they couldn't continue to sponsor after a few years because oil prices were really low and that damaged their economy. So then I spent a lot of my own money, all of it. And then I took a loan, and I took a second loan, and spent most of that. Then I started doing crowdfunding campaigns and I got support and help from online community. Lots of support, lots of donations. Then eventually Ross Energy came back on. So it's a mix between corporate funding, self-funding and donations. And you also do work with the Red Cross as well, yeah? Yeah, so the Red Cross hasn't paid for anything within this and that's exactly how it's supposed to be. So if you donate money to the Red Cross, then you have to know that that goes to humanitarian work. I traveled as a goodwill ambassador of the Danish Red Cross, and I've met with the Red Cross in 198 countries around the world, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. I've raised funds for the humanitarian organization. I've donated blood on several accounts. I try to mention them in interviews and bring attention to the humanitarian work around the world. 
but no money from the Red Cross. Money to the Red Cross. Any more? <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, you've been traveling to Africa, you mentioned, and yes. I was wondering, because I'm a long-distance cyclist, I've been cycling on a tandem to Singapore lately, and uh, we our next plan is to cycle through Africa, but we already know that it's almost impossible to go through every country because some of those countries are on war or actually dangerous. So I was wondering, is the, those countries, which are mentioned as dangerous, did you just uh, stay for 24 hours just to say that you've been there or could you m really manage to stay there? How, how did you do? Mm. It's a good question. And good on you for the cycling. That sounds really interesting. Um, if you want to cycle Africa, then a very popular road is uh, from Cape Town to Cairo. And uh, you do East Coast. That would be the easiest in terms of paperwork and also the safest. And lots of people do that. I met a German guy in the south of Germany who just picked up his ordinary bicycle, no special bicycle, anything, just his ordinary shoes and his shorts, and then he cycled down through <laughs> all of Africa. Everyone says in, in Ethiopia it's a little bit hard for cyclists. For some reason, in Ethiopia, the children, especially in rural uh, villages, they see it as a bit of a sport to pick up small rocks and throw them after cyclists. And they don't do it if you're walking. They don't do it if you get off your bicycle. They don't do it if you're in a bus or in a car. But they do it if you cycle. And I hear this from every cyclist. Um, dangerous countries. I don't really like the term. I don't believe in dangerous countries. I believe in dangerous people. And some countries have more dangerous people than others. But the countries are not dangerous. And I've found so much kindness and so much generosity in every one of those countries that are in the evening news and that we're being warned about and where there's enormous hardship. That's where I find a lot of kindness. But there's also a lack of a safety net. So everything can feel normal. You're meeting people, you're invited to a wedding, you sit down, you have a cup of tea and a nice meal, but if something happens, then you're really in trouble in a way that you wouldn't be in trouble if you're in France. There's a great safety net here. If something happens, there's all sorts of systems. There are all sorts of systems in place to take care of us. So yes, in some cases, 24 hours and then out. I did that pretty much with uh, Yemen and with South Sudan. Other countries, I stayed much longer. Some countries are very large, and even though there's conflict in one part of the country, you can feel perfectly safe in another part of the country. And Somalia, which would be one of those countries that you might be warned about, I got stuck in Somalia. So I suddenly spent a lot of time in Somalia trying to get out. Kyle? Yeah, I mean, amazing story, uh, very inspiring, and I'm like, s I have so many different questions about the logistics of how you did this, but I guess just to start, what is the process for g hitching a ride on a, on a container ship? Yeah, right. Well, thank you, first of all. And thank you for your support and helping me out with the gear. Um, it's a nightmare. It, it's, it, it, it really is. So I think a lot of people have this romantic notion of... Uh, going to the port, talking to the captain and saying, well, I can work, uh, maybe I can help cook or clean, and then I'll get a ride across, right? And this was probably true in the 60s and the 70s and maybe even the 80s. But then eventually it got so commercialized, they're spending a minimum of time in the port because the port is the most expensive place that these ships can be. So they just get cargo operations done and then they head out to sea again. And there are all sorts of safety concerns and insurance. And so it's in many ways like going to an office somewhere in the city and then asking the receptionist if you can sleep on the floor. And then she'll say, well, why don't you go to a hotel or a hostel? And say, no, but you have plenty of floor space. Just let me sleep here for a few days. But for some reason, people don't see that with container ships. They feel like, well, it's a mode of transportation. It's going from A to B. They have extra room. They might as well take me. But they see that as their home, and it's a workplace. Um, so then we had 9-11, uh, and then suddenly they introduced ISPS security uh, in all the ports. 
So that's terror security. And that made everything absolutely impossible. So now it's suddenly almost impossible to get on these ships. Nothing is truly impossible, but it is really, really hard. So it becomes about incentive. And you need to incentivize the corporations that own container ships. You cannot speak to the captain, because if the captain takes you on board and the company doesn't like it, then they will fire the captain. So the captain will do whatever the corporation says. So you have to talk to the shipping company. And the shipping company is busy, and they probably fired half the staff, so everyone's dealing with twice as many emails, and then they get an email from you saying, I want to go on a container ship, and they'll delete it, right? Or maybe they'll answer, we can't do it because of insurance, or safety security, or local rules, or immigration, or something like this. But if you do get their attention, then you have to incentivize them and tell them why should they bring you on board the ship. And you can't offer anything. You can't work on board because insurance will not allow it. So why should they bring you on board? You might be sick. Uh, you might uh, spread a disease on board. You might fall overboard. You might break something. You might be annoying. There might be all sorts of reasons to say no. What is the reason to say yes? And it's so hard to find a reason that you can give a shipping company <laughs> why they should bring you on board. But maybe if you're a journalist, then you can say, well, I can cover your story and your green profile, and I can give you some attention. Or if you have millions of followers on social media, then you have a chance because, again, a profile and a platform. Or if you have a special story, and I happen to have a special story, so that helped me on board. But I guarantee you, every time you saw me get on a ship, there were nine companies that said no. Kyle, you just got here. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot harder now, he said. Like, he said it would be almost impossible for someone to repeat it just based on the container ship stuff. Yeah, it's so, so, so much harder. There, there are three areas where it's getting harder to get uh, to every country in the world without flying. One is that it's getting more and more impossible to get on board the container ships. And you will need the container ships, especially within the Pacific. Uh, there may be cruise ships, maybe some sailboats, but definitely the container ships will, will be very helpful. And you will not get access to them. Then a lot of land borders are not accessible anymore. So in Europe, it's still easy, but a lot of places around the world, they have border security to a degree where they will not issue a visa if you want to cross the land border. They want you to fly. There's more security at the airport. They can check you and paperwork and train staff and so on. So, uh, and for islands as well, if you arrive on an island and you do not have a plan how to leave, then uh, immigration will not allow you inside the country. So that can be a hassle as well. And a lot of the ferries around the world that would take you from one country to the next are disappearing because they're being replaced by airplanes. So this was happening while I was traveling, and uh, it's only getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. Or harder and harder and Anyone harder. Anyone else? Yep. Hi. Um, how, what's your point, point of view on the news today? Um, because I guess during 10 years you follow news in Europe, maybe? And you also follow the news on, on the, about the country where you you visit. Um, for example, in Sudan there is a war actually, but nobody uh, talk about it in Europe. So today, what's your how how do you yeah. do you do you <laughs> do you think about the news in Europe when there is some horrible things in poor country like Sudan? Yeah, I think a lot about all of these things because I have a connection to every country in the world. I know somebody pretty much in every country in the world. I know what it's like to be there. I've tasted the food. I, it's, it's hard for me at this point. Um, now we have with Israel and Palestine and, and Lebanon, the part of Lebanon with South Sudan. And uh, Sudan, as you mentioned, three and a half million people inter internally displaced or as refugees across the border. Three and a half million people, that's insane, right? And the, I mean, the list goes on. What I know in my heart, because I've seen it and I've experienced it, is that the, what we see in the media doesn't really correspond with the overall world as it exists. So when we hear that there's an attack in Paris, then Paris is a huge city with many, many millions of people. And most uh, people in Paris, their lives continue. They still go to school, they still go to market, they still clean, they still visit their sister, and so on, so on, so on. This is true all around the world. 
that the cameras will often point at what's the worst elements of this planet. But the cameraman is often safe, and behind the cameraman, the taxis and the school children and the markets and all of this keeps operating. So what is my, what is my feeling about it? This is not a perfect world, but it is so much better than what we give it credit for. And it's because of the people that live in this planet, not necessarily on a governmental level, because there's a lot of corruption on this planet. But most people are not leaders or military dictators or terrorists. Most people are just people with families and interests, and they like dancing and TikTok and talking about Netflix, and they go to work and their sports and all of this stuff. And my assessment of the planet and every country across this planet is that it's like playing an opposite lottery. So it's a lottery where you're winning almost all the time. It's possible to lose. There are some bad people out there, but almost everyone you talk to or you meet or anyone who contacts you is going to be kind or courteous or funny if you're lucky. Well said. Can't follow thank that you. up at all. Maybe we should end with that point. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to thank you because the messages you share and the experience you have is really cool to get it firsthand, to follow you, to meet you in person after four or five years of liking tweets and Instagram <laughs> posts and trading a couple of messages here and there. It's pretty cool to meet you in the flesh. Likewise. And, and congratulations to having done it. It's yeah. incredible. Um, thank you. I guess last one for me is if you could go right now anywhere besides Hong Kong to sit down for a good meal, where would you go? End on a lighter note. <laughs> Do you have one in mind? And so there's so much good food around the world okay. that it's crazy. There's not a single country in the world where people, they adore bad food. Mm -hmm. Everyone loves good food, so they have, uh, for thousands of years they worked out which spices grow in their area, what they can grow in the ground, and they make good and nice food. My food country is Italy. And not because Italy just oh, has... Yeah. Well, <laughs> one Italian guy not just because <laughs> Italy has pasta and pizza, which everybody likes, but Italy is a food country. It has uh, fish and vegetables and fruit, and it has south and north and east and west and mountains and lowland. There's so much good food in Italy, so you can't really run out of good food when you're there. And it just speaks to my taste. But there's a lot of good food around the world. There's like 40 offended French people right <laughs> now. No, sorry about that. I didn't know we were going to go in that direction. You'll have to go get some good food tonight. Plenty of it here. But um, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thor, for being here. Thank you all for My tuning pleasure. in. Oh, okay. Last one. <laughs> um, what is uh, your... Uh, most uh, dangerous and funny uh, moment in uh, your uh, travel? It's not the same, I can but tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the most dangerous was a um, checkpoint in the middle of the night in Central Africa. I was in the very south of Congo, very close to the border with Congo. It was around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. I'd been in a vehicle, a Toyota Corolla, together with a driver for many, many hours, and we were tired, and it was hard driving on a dirt road for a very, very long time. And it was night, it was dark, and we have the lights from the car shining into the dust. And um, sometimes we see some eyes from an animal crossing, but other than that, we didn't see anything. And then suddenly there are three shadows, and they stop the car, and these are soldiers, or at least men in uniform, and they are armed to their teeth, and they're drunk out of their mind. And they command us out of the vehicle, and I come out, and the driver comes out. And from the moment they saw me, I had to carry the entire weight of hundreds of years of colonialism. This man was so angry. He was so upset with me. They were so emotional, and they were drunk, and they were armed, and they were aggressive. And I knew I was going to die. Not within an hour, I knew I was going to die in seconds from that moment. And if not seconds, then a few minutes. And it was the only thing I had in my head was, I'm dying tonight, I'm dying right here, I'm dying. That's just a question of one of them making a quick movement or a mistake or tripping or something like this. And it went on for 45 minutes. So that was the worst. <coughs> the funniest? 
I don't know. There's been a lot of funny stuff. But there is a pretty good story. If we do have a couple of minutes, I don't know. If we Let's can end with a funny one. <laughs> <laughs> no, so there's, there's a story where I'm on top of a truck for uh, a couple of days, together with 50 or 60 people. And it's miserable, and nobody's enjoying being on top of this truck. It's painful, the sun is shining, it's dusty, it's just horrible throughout. But then on the first night, the sun was setting, and this woman, she has a water bottle, and she starts banging that water bottle and making a rhythm. And then she starts singing, and it sounds so beautiful. And the sun is setting, and the dust, and the landscape, and it's magical. And then another woman starts singing, and then suddenly everybody, 50, 60 people, are singing this song. And I didn't understand the lyrics or the language, but it's just beautiful and magical. And it was a moment just for me. And it lasted about 15 minutes, and the sun sat, and they stopped singing, and it was miserable again. But those 15 minutes were good. Yeah. Thanks. My Appreciate pleasure. it. Thank you, everyone. Put the hat on. Put the hat on. Come on. It's part of your personality. So, thanks everyone for tuning in. I think. Looking back now, would you say it was a good idea? It seemed like a good idea. <laughs> Welcome to Sudan, Vietnam, Egypt. Starting in his home country, Denmark, Thor Peterson set out on a mission to visit every country in the world without using an airplane. If you're trying to go to every country in the world, it's challenging. What Thor is doing, it's insane. I'm doing it because it has not been done before. I can't believe how difficult this is. It was never meant to be like this. He thought it would take just below four years. Today marks eight years, eight months, and eight days. It's like, you just started up a relationship. How are you going to do this? I cannot stop him in doing what he wants to do. But why is he going to leave all that behind? Breaking point, the airport looks really tempting. Son, if I should die, don't fly home to look at the dead body. I've done 90% of it. How do you not cross that finish line when it's right there? That is getting close. Has everything so much harder than what it has to be. Either you've done it or you've not done it at all. So my decision is complete or quit. And I'm not quitting. I have strength within myself to fight for this. I'm going to fight until I drop. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. There's just French pizza, I think. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, guys.